Okay, so what is the problem of other minds then? Well, one way of stating the problem may simply be to point out that in our everyday interactions or engagements with other people, people are enigmatic and confusing to us, sometimes they're unpredictable. And there's a sense in which most of us, I imagine, will think there's something intuitively correct about what might be called a sort of Cartesian picture. That is a picture that's indebted to Rene Descartes, which says, well, look, I have some kind of privileged access to my own mental states. I can introspect about my feelings. If someone stomps on my foot and causes me pain, I have some kind of inner relation to that pain. None of you have that kind of inner relation to my pain. So on that sort of Cartesian picture that many philosophers are still um, seriously indebted to, I would say, um, there is something inaccessible about the mental states of other people as well as whether people have minds at all and are merely, uh, well, have what philosophers will call qualia. So mental experience, how do I know you're not robots, elaborately disguised? How do I know you're not zombies uh, who behave in certain ways but don't actually have the mental states of pain, don't have desires, beliefs, etc.? So one way of sort of setting up this problem may just be to see our experience, I suppose, pushes in both directions in relation to other people and what kind of access we have to them. On one level, there's, I suppose, a common sense intuition. When someone raises their fist like this at a football game and looks like they're about to belt the opposing supporter, it seems at least that we directly perceive their anger. It seems to us that way. And yet there are so many other dimensions of our experience in which other people are enigmatic and elusive. So we have these two intuitions which pull in different directions. We have a direct and immediate relation to others, which you might say is grounded in considerations from developmental psychology. Um, so neonates or kids re relating to parents at an early age. Um, and yet there seems something to this, I suppose, more epistemic intuition, but don't I, aren't, aren't I the only one who can access my own pain? Aren't I the only one who has access to whether I'm trepidatious or nervous about giving a lecture or not? You guys can't perceive that if I'm a good actor. Um, so presumably there's something about that that we need to take into account as well. One way of formalising the problem of other minds, um, this is indebted to an ex-colleague of mine, James Chase at the University of Tasmania. Um, he formalises the problem in the following way. Premise one. If I know that other people have minds, then my knowledge must be based just on the evidence of their behaviour. Because this is starting from the intuition, I don't have telepathy, I can't get inside your heads, presumably, um, so what access do I have to you? Just what you do, your behaviour. Second premise, I can't know that something has a mind just from the evidence of its behaviour. Um, so again, it's conceivable that we may have been tricked by some sort of illusion, that you could be an elaborately disguised robot, you could be a science fiction type scenario, um, you may not have mental life, but you may behave in a way that I take to think indicates you have mental life, but I can't be justified in claiming that is so. So the conclusion seems to follow from these two premises that I don't know that other people have minds. So one of the philosophical terms to associated with this sort of position is called solipsism. Solipsism is the doctrine that we can't know or access the minds of anybody else. It's the idea that we know only our own perspective. Uh, and one epistemological consequence of this is I can't prove that you all have minds. Yes, I can see bodies in the lecture theatre. Yes, I can see some of you seem to me to look more bored or more interested than others. Um, but I can't, in fact, prove that you have minds. So this may seem to you all to be an example of where philosophy goes wrong, reaching such radically counterintuitive conclusions. Presumably something you may want to say has gone wrong with the premises or has gone wrong with my reasoning here. And I think you're probably right to think in such a manner. But the question is, the difficult task in philosophy is to um, 
well, establish where that mistake in reasoning has taken place uh, and what might be a better solution to the problem of other minds that avoids what Jean-Paul Sartre calls the reef of solipsism. So when Sartre makes this refrain, what he's saying is almost no philosophers sort of come out and say, yes, I am a solipsist. I know only my own perspective, can't know any others, can't know that there are other minds. However, Sartre, I think plausibly, suggests that many philosophers are actually committed to a position that is solipsistic, even if they don't own that position, even if they don't explicitly acknowledge it, they have problems accounting for the existence of others in a plausible fashion. So even though the problem of other minds may seem sort of abstract and strange, it's actually a problem that many philosophical positions are confronted by. All right, so I don't know if anybody wants to have a guess at ways of solving um, the problem of other minds. Perhaps the most common way of responding to the problem of other minds is what's called the argument by analogy. Um, the argument by analogy has a fairly rich heritage, especially with empiricist philosophers. Um, so philosophers who've proposed solutions of this nature uh, include John Stuart Mill um, and others in the 20th century. The argument by analogy in some sense says, I'll present it a little bit glibly, but basically it says, look, if someone stomps on my foot I know that this causes me an experience of pain and that my face will grimace. So if I see someone stomp on your foot and your face grimaces, aren't I entitled to say, well, that's because you have the experience of pain too. So that's an argument by analogy. I argue from my own experience to your experience. So again, this formalization is courtesy of James Chase we could present the formal argument in the following way. Psycho-behavioural rules are true of me. One example of the psycho-behavioural rule is, um, you know, if you burn your hand, you'll pull your hand away, for example. Um, so I know this is true of me. I know that my experience of pain, something that Emma um, does a lot of research on, my experience of pain, at least in most cases, in the tutorial, she may complicate this for some of you. At least in most cases, the experience of pain causes me to withdraw my hand from the hot um, oven, for example. And if I see you um, withdraw your hand from the hot oven and go red in the face, then aren't I entitled to say, well, by analogy, you must also have mental states, uh, the mental state of pain, like I do. So that's a psycho-behavioral rule, with some exceptions. So second premise, as far as I can tell, you're all pretty similar to me. If you put your hand on the stove, unless you're one of the cases Emma's interested in, you're gonna withdraw it because the pain's gonna, um, well, basically force you to withdraw it unless you're a rather devout masochist of some kind. So it seems to follow that by analogy then, psychobehavioral rules are true of other people, at least in most cases, and so I can infer that you do, in fact, have the mental state of pain because you're acting in much the same manner as I do when I suffer pain. Okay, so what are the sort of main problems with the argument by analogy? Any thoughts? Anybody want to raise some potential issues for it? Hopefully some of you are sort of primed to raise objections to the argument by analogy since it, well, one of the main objections relates to the material on induction from last week. Nobody? Everybody thinks it's a good argument? The main argument is that, the main problem with the argument, apologies, is that a good inductive generalization will typically need to involve consideration of more than one case. But in relation to this argument by analogy, I only have access to my own case, and I'm gonna generalize from my single case about all other cases. That seems a bit scientifically tenuous. Um, so think, for example, uh, I think Stephen Law raises this in the philosophy gym. Um, think, for example, if you entertained a banal scientific hypothesis Obviously science is more sophisticated than this, but philosophers like to simplify things. 
Think, for example, if you entertained the rather obvious scientific hypothesis that all cherries have stones. Um, and you entertain this hypothesis on the basis of cutting just one cherry open and finding one stone. Do you think that that is legitimate warrant for concluding that all cherries have stones? Um, even if you happen to be correct, it doesn't seem that you're justified in claiming from cutting one cherry open that all cherries must have stones. It may be an unusual cherry. It's only a single instance. You need to do more than merely cut into one cherry to attempt to justify that hypothesis. So the problem with the argument by analogy is we only look at my mental case or you look at your own psychobehavioral nexus and you conclude that all others are like this. Well, one case arguably is not sufficient for that inductive generalization. There are other sorts of problems with the argument by analogy. They're perhaps less pressing. Uh, one of them would be, well, if I attempt to argue by analogy to your mental states now, to asset, not that I have any psychic powers, but to attempt to ascertain you know, what you're feeling or thinking, um, I've already presupposed that you do have a mind in order to try and argue by analogy to what you're thinking or feeling. I've already presupposed that you are a thinking, feeling creature, um, rather than offer an independent argument for that conclusion. So another way of putting this might be to say, this is philosophers use this jargon all the time, I would be begging the question. That just means I'm ostensibly asking a question, well, how do I know there are other people? Or how do I know other people have minds? And yet, if I use the argument by analogy, I'm assuming other people have minds because I'm trying to put myself in your shoes, so to speak, and argue by analogy to what you might be thinking or feeling. So I'm essentially already assuming that you're minded. Um, in fact, in terms of the inductive problem, one thing that I haven't mentioned, which I will, um, just because it's a nice and easy way of presenting the inductive problem. Let's just say we're attempting to reason by analogy to the mental state of someone else. Well, um, people are quite different. People think and feel quite differently. So there's an open question here about whether, um, let's say if Adolf Hitler attempted to reason by analogy to um, the experiences, the feelings, the thought processes of Mother Teresa. Um, could he adequately do so? Obviously the problem also applies in the reverse way. Could Mother Teresa reason by analogy to the mental states and beliefs of Adolf Hitler? Certainly it seems reasonably unlikely. Um, so not only is there a problem with the argument by analogy from my psychobehavioral nexus, the relationship between my body and my mind, in my own case, to all other minds in general. Um, there's also a more specific problem with the argument by analogy if I'm attempting to justify my claims, my partner's angry with me, or um, she's despondent, for example, because of this issue. Because of the issue, not just cultural variability, but because of the variability, at least in the way people seem to think and feel, um, it seems difficult to justify attributions of particular mental states like anger, disgust, joy, uh, on that basis. To some extent, the, the final objection to the argument by analogy that I want to raise here might be said to um, collapse the distinction that I drew at the outset, the distinction between issues to do with epistemic justification and the descriptive problem of other minds, that is, how do we form our particular beliefs um, about others? But one objection to the argument by analogy may just be that it seems to be very sort of inferential in nature. It presupposes that we're sort of completely separate from others. We have to make up that gap somehow. The only way to make up that gap is through inference, through reasoning. Arguably there's something, there's some sort of more immediate connection that we have with others that isn't um, explicated 
on such an understanding. So the philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty talks about the perceptual faith, uh, and part of the perceptual faith, at least on his account, which we're going to come back to, uh, involves a more immediate perceptual uh, interconnection with other people. All right. So another sort of attempted solution to the problem of other minds is called an inference to the best explanation. Now, I'm assuming that, I could be wrong about this, but I'm assuming that you have studied, at least briefly, inferences to the best explanation. Are there any people nodding? I imagine that Tim Oakley at some point would have said, even if Tim wants to subscribe to a version of scepticism himself, I imagine that he would have at least considered the possibility that well, rather than being sceptical about the external world, perhaps the best explanation of our experience of the external world just is that there is an external world. Um, in any case, an inference to the best explanation is a probabilistic explanation, um, so it doesn't offer definitive or apodictic certainty or proof. It's not incontrovertible. Um, but one way of addressing the problem of other minds that has become quite significant in recent times is to offer our, a justification in terms of an inference to the best explanation. So how does this work? Again, I'm no expert in science, but the analogy with science is a strong one, even if the details of what I'm about to say end up being incorrect. Um, from what I understand, electrons are not themselves directly observable. So you don't directly at least so I understand, observe electrons. You do, however, observe uh, behavioural effects, and it is posited that electrons um, serve as the best explanation for the behavioural effects that you do observe. Now, if you think this is incorrect about e electrons, you can substitute it for something even more sub-molecular, whatever the case may be. A lot of good scientific theories are essentially inferences to the best explanation. Um, so we don't directly observe um, the thing that we're claiming exists, uh, but we do observe particular things, and the argument goes, uh, in order to understand the things that we do observe, we need to posit electrons or some such kind of entity. So the way Paul Churchland puts this, a theory about something that's strictly unobservable, nonetheless, and now I begin the quote, can be belief worthy we should believe in it, if it allows us to explain and predict some domain of observable phenomena better than any other competing theory. So the inference to the best explanation about other minds concedes that I have no access to your mental states at all. However, it says that I'm justified in claiming that you do have mental states, that you're angry or bored, whatever the case may be, that you have minds in general, because in positing that theory, it allows me to explain the things that you do. So, you know, if people start walking out of the lecture, um, following a look of blankness or boredom, well, I can say, I'm justified in saying that you have the mental state of boredom because it allows me to explain the fact that you and a couple of others have walked out of the lecture. So I don't have any direct, incontrovertible evidence, but it's more like a scientific hypothesis. Um, if it is a better explanation than the other explanation, let's say that you're all zombies, why shouldn't I go with the explanation um, that you in fact have mental states like me? So Alec Hislop, a Latrobe uh, alumni, uh, who in fact wrote the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on the problem of other minds, which is one of the readings, or was meant to be one of the readings for this week, along with the stuff by Stephen Law and Soren Overgaard, Hislop says, the guiding thought is that the mental states of human beings are what cause them to behave as they do. So the inference to their having minds is one based on that being the best explanation for the way that they behave. So again, the suggestion would be, I have no direct access to any of your minds, uh, either in expressive life, uh, and of course not in telepathy either, I have no sort of direct access. Nonetheless, 
My attributing minds to you and particular mental states is justified because it allows me to explain things that happen better than other explanations. Okay. Hopefully the inference to the best explanation is pretty clear. Um, some of the objections to the inference to the best explanation are going to be related to those that oppose to the argument by analogy. Um, again, it seems sort of heavily indebted to a Cartesian framework in that we're sort of locked in our own minds and don't have access to other minds. All I can do is probabilistically infer that you all have minds. Again, this seems to be... Um, it doesn't seem to capture once more, again, this may be sort of a phenomenological conviction with, that we think should be overturned, but it doesn't seem to capture uh, our sort of phenomenological conviction that our connections with others is more certain or than any particular scientific theory or beliefs that we may have. So Ludwig Wittgenstein, for example, is one philosopher who has, um, in the philosophical investigations and elsewhere, suggested that uh, not only is my capacity to attribute mental states to myself, like pain, dependent on being able to attribute mental states to others, your pain, um, that's part of the language game of using the term pain. Well, pain's in fact a complicated example for Wittgenstein. Nonetheless, there is this, the, my ability to attribute mental states to myself depends upon my ability to attribute them to others. Um, and Wittgenstein would also suggest that um, there's a certain sense in which our certainty about others, uh, well, if you like, is part of the form of life that we inhabit rather than something that would need to be theoretically justified in terms of a scientific hypothesis of some kind. All right. Um, there may be other issues people can raise with the inference to the best explanation. Just very briefly, one of the contemporary issues um, devolves from developmental psychology uh, in that neonates, newborn infants, do seem to understand other people, their emotions, their intentions, uh, behavioural expressions, at very early stages, almost immediately after birth, to some degree, certainly in the first year of life, where it doesn't seem clear that we can say that they're theorising or inferring or reasoning or anything like that. So let me just very briefly, I won't go into this in any detail due to time, um, these, this is a famous study by Andrew Meltzoff um, in the 1980s concerning infant imitation. Um, this can happen 42 minutes or 42 seconds, I can't remember the details, after birth. Um, this capacity to imitate selectively humans rather than non-humans and also to play with humans. It's, not, it's alleged not to be a mere instinct. It suggests some sort of basic understanding, I suppose, of others, even if in a sort of incipient form, in early neonatal experience. All right, but I won't develop that further here. Now I'm going to move on to what I've called non-inferential uh, solutions to the problem of other minds. So most of these solutions are going to come from some, a group of philosophers called phenomenologists. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that, that probably most philosophers don't buy these solutions today. Um, although these solutions do have something in common with uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein's solutions also around the same period of time in the 1940s or thereabouts. Um, Basically, they're going to attempt to suggest that any attempt to justify our knowledge of other minds through inferential reasoning processes or through potential inferential or reasoning processes somehow fails to, or radically fails to, capture what sort of connection we do have uh, with other people. So, what sort of solution would it be? Well, all of the phenomenologists that I'm going to consider to differing extents, 
advocate a view that we might call direct perception. They're going to say, at least in some experiences, not in all experiences, but at least in some experiences of, of other people, um, our best justification for claiming that we know someone else's mental states is precisely their expression. With no need for inference, no need for theories, no need for um, rational processes about that. Um, so maybe a way to come at this problem might be to think, if I said to you, just assume for a moment you're not Tim Oakley and you're not radically sceptical. If I said to you, all right, what's your justification for claiming, as in the second dot point here, someone asks you, is Jack rapidly going bald? You're entitled to conclude, unless you're a radical sceptic, presumably you're entitled to conclude yes, based on perception. Most philosophers will agree with that, I think except for the radical skeptics like Tim. The question is, however, is our experiences of other people, say when Jack gets angry, and you perceive that, is that radically different in kind from this boldness example? Um, so is our justification for claiming that Jack is angry or our friend is angry the same as this case, or is it different in kind, perhaps involving perception plus judgment or perception plus inference, perception plus some sort of theory, whether it be tacit or otherwise. Um, this is a way, I suppose, of sort of motivating the dispute here. A significant group of philosophers, albeit not the majority, want to maintain that as with, even though it's not exactly the same scenario, but as with the case, your justification for saying that I'm bald, or going bald at least, can be, can be justified only in virtue of sight or perception, Maybe you want to come and feel my hair, but it doesn't feel that good. Um, so the justification for attributing anger, joy, and some of these canonical uh, expressive emotions is nothing other than the in perception or the, the expression itself. So here's a couple of examples. Max Shaler in The Nature of Sympathy, written in the 1920s, I think. Shaler says, we certainly believe ourselves to be directly acquainted with another person's joy in his laughter and with his sorrow and pain in his tears, with his shame in his blushing. If anyone tells me that this is not perception, for it cannot be so, in view of the fact that there is no sensation of another person's mind nor any stimulus from such a source, I would beg him to turn aside from such questionable theories and address him or herself to the phenomenological facts. Jean-Paul Sartre, apologies for the formatting there. Of course, Sartre says, and Sartre's the man who famously says, hell is other people, and that in some sense, wondering what others are thinking about us is something that perennially haunts us, um, that we can never be sure of. It sounds like he's signing up to a, a sort of theory in which the other's elusive or unknown. Nonetheless, he wants to maintain this. Of course, there is a psychic cryptography. Certain phenomena are hidden. But this certainly does not mean that the meanings refer to something beyond the body. These frowns, this redness, this stammering, this trembling of the hands, these downcast looks, which seem at once timid and threatening, these do not express anger, they are the anger. But this point must be clearly understood. In itself, a clenched fist is nothing and means nothing, but we also never perceive a clenched fist we perceive a man or a person who in a certain situation, in a certain context, clenches his fist. Final quote of this order. Maurice Merleau-Ponty from his book, Phenomenology of Perception. Faced with an angry or threatening gesture, I have no need, in order to understand it, to recall the feelings which I myself experienced when I used these gestures on my own account. I know very little from inside of the mime of anger, so that a decisive factor is missing for any association by resemblance or reasoning by analogy. And what is more, I do not see anger or a threatening attitude as a psychic fact hidden behind the gesture. I read anger in it. The gesture, the clenched fist, when I'm suitably angry, it's hard to pull off, I'm not a good actor. We may come back to acting in a moment. The gesture does not make me think of anger. It is anger itself. Okay.
So these are three statements of a direct perception view, which, as I said, can also be attributed, to some extent at least, to the, the work of Wittgenstein. Uh, and there are contemporary theorists of direct perception too, albeit still in the minority. So the question that we're going to have to ask is, um, well, what's going on with these sort of solutions? Do we agree that um, my, I can be just as certain about the anger of someone else as I can about my own anger, which these theorists are pretty much committed to saying? They're going to contest the view that I have sort of privileged access through introspection to my own thoughts. I can be wrong about myself. I can be self-deluded. Um, and they're going to maintain, even though the access isn't the same, my access to myself is different from my access to your mental states, I can nonetheless be as justified and as certain in attributing anger, I don't know, to my colleague or my boss when they're angry with me as I can in re relation to my own anger, my own mental life. Now, there are lots of other things that might be said in this debate or in this dispute, one of which probably the currently um, most dominant view is to say, well, yeah, of course, phenomenologically, we don't think there's any kind of inferences going on when we perceive someone else's anger. It appears to us as though we just perceive the anger on the surface. But one might say one of two things. We're actually not justified epistemically uh, in concluding that. Or one might say, descriptively, there's actually subconference subconscious inferences or theoretical processes going on that I'm not myself aware of. Um, so someone might say, well, look, when I see your boredom, um, it may be that it feels to me that I'm perceiving that directly and there's no need for any inferential processes. On the other hand, it could also be that over you know, experiences, empirical experiences in the world, I've built up these sort of subconscious or automatic or habitual inferences that are involved. I'm not going to try and settle this question, but um, Soren Overgaard, I think, has recently pointed out, to me, I think, quite plausibly, that the thing about habitual inferences is that they can usually be blocked once one becomes aware of them. Um, so if one is making a habitual inference, let's say one of the prime examples of I said, this could be used as a counterexample to direct perception, right? Police are notorious in America, probably in Australia too, for perceiving situations in a racial context. So if they see a man late at night, um, African American, by himself or hovering around a door, for that policeman, they infer that, well, they perceive that something is going wrong a crime is about to be committed. If it happened to be someone who was white in roughly the same situation, there's good psychological evidence that they don't perceive as readily a crime about to be committed. So this might say direct perception. Probably something is amiss with that view if it, if it allows for the possibility of racial profiling of this sort. But one thing that can be shown is that once the policemen are informed about the fact that they standardly and typically um, faced with the same sort of stimulus, the same phenomenon, uh, attribute in one case the motive or an intention to commit a crime and in the other case no intention to commit a crime. When they become aware of that they can block this habitual fast inference if you will. The question is whether something like that happens with anger, uh, joy, disgust and these other sort of uh, standard emotional expressions. There's a sense in which these experiences continue to appear to us, so Soren Overgaard says, as sadness, as anger, um, and they can't be blocked in the way that habitual inferences can be blocked by becoming aware of them. One continues to look despondent, for example. At least that's a possibility. Okay, so problems with direct perception. Maybe it seems like it makes the problem, it sort of resolves the problem of other minds by fiat, it, it obscures the complexity and opaqueness of our relations with other people. Um, but we should bear in mind the direct perception view 
It doesn't say I can, I can perceive you know, your higher order reflective thoughts. It simply says in some cases, direct perception is sufficient. And that will be in these cases of emotional expressions. The six emotional expressions that are said to be sort of cross-culturally standard. Disgust, joy, can't remember them all. Anger, sadness, that's four. All right, so I've, I've responded to this sort of Amanda Knox type story. Well, I haven't actually, so of course you may, this, this may be one objection to the direct perception view. The prosecutor in Italy back in the day when Amanda Knox was found guilty um, said, this is a quote, we were able to establish guilt by closely observing the suspect's psychological and behavioral reaction during the interrogation. We don't need to rely on other kinds of investigation. So they didn't need to rely on DNA. They didn't need to rely on, at least according to the way he presents it, any sort of inference. They perceived her guilt in some sense. But hopefully I've done enough to suggest that that objection may not be the end of the matter for the direct perception view. One of the other objections might be, it looks like a return to behaviorism. Behaviorism was a position in philosophy of mind, um, yeah, around the 40s and 50s in analytic philosophy that many philosophers uh, have dismissed. Uh, so there are some potential problems still with direct perception that would need to be grappled with. All right, maybe this will be more fun for everyone for five minutes. In the last part of the lecture, I want to look at Sartre's solution to the problem of other minds in the book Being and Nothingness. Um, so what does Jean-Paul Sartre say? Sartre says he agrees with the other phenomenologists that inference and theoretical means to know others are somehow going to be never more than probabilistic, never going to capture our actual ontological connection with other people. So Sartre says, well, what would capture that? What we need to find, rather than assume a separate self who is distanced from other people, is some experience that we all have that has the existence of other people as its necessary condition. The experience that Sartre says that we all have is shame. Now, shame is perhaps not the best term that Sartre may have chosen to use, since shame, I suppose, is quite negative. It also has a moral connotation to it. When Sartre uses the term shame, he, he means shame in a pre-moral sense. So let me try and, albeit not with Sartre's vividness, let me try and give you the scenario that Sartre paints in order to make this point. Imagine that you were peeping through a keyhole at something going on the other side of a door. I don't know how many of you have actually done this, but you can imagine it in any case. Sartre says, you know, you might be a little bit nervous initially doing it, but after a period of time, you'd be given over to perceiving what's going on on the other side of the door, and you'd cease to be sort of attentive to yourself as someone who could potentially be caught as a peeping Tom. You'd be immersed in the perception of what's going on the other side of the door. Sartre says, all of a sudden, then you hear footsteps. At that moment, at that instant, you feel yourself objectified. There's nothing you can do about this. There's no choice you can make, Sartre says. We're overwhelmed in that instance by a feeling of something like shame in a non-moral sense that we are an object seen by another person. Sartre wants to say, he calls this the look. In the look, we momentarily lose our subjectivity and experience ourselves as the object of another's judgment. Sartre thinks this experience is sort of alienating, but what's his, claim, what's his philosophical claim here? Something forces us, Sartre says, to go from being pre-reflectively immersed in this situation, peeping through the keyhole, not really aware of ourselves um, in any sort of self-reflexive manner, just engaged in what it is that we're looking at, to suddenly feeling an awareness of ourselves as a peeping Tom to an awareness of ourselves as an object for another person. What does Sartre want to say about this? He wants to say, well, this is the structure of the argument. Shame happens 
He may dispute this premise, he may dispute Sartre's phenomenological description of the way this happens. If people are interested in my copy of Being a Nothingness, it's page 261. Um, shame happens, we have this experience of the look of being an object in the eyes of another person. He says such experiences, premise two, are only possible if other subjects exist. Sartre says, for example, you couldn't have this experience of suddenly being overwhelmed by by a feeling of your own status as an object in front of chairs. Sartre says you couldn't have it in front of other animals either, unless you were sort of anthropomorphizing and, for Sartre at least, confusing yourself. Sartre says the experience of being objectified in this manner, which we have no choice about, presupposes another subject who is doing the objectifying. So Sartre's strategy here is to say, forget about inferential or probabilistic reasoning that might justify why I claim there are other minds in the world or that might justify why I claim that someone is angry. Instead, we need to look within ourselves, find an experience that we have, in this case shame, the look of the other, and Sartre says we need to see that a necessary condition for that experience to be as it is, is that there are other subjects in the world. So Dan Zahavi, a Husserlian phenomenologist, summarises Sartre's point in this way. The other, Zahavi says, is exactly the being for whom I can appear as an object. Thus, rather than focusing upon the other as a specific object of empathy, Sartre argues that foreign subjectivity, the other as other, is revealed to me through my awareness of myself qua being an object for another person. It is when I experience my own objectivity for and before a foreign subject that I have experiential evidence for the presence of another as subject. All right, maybe that was a bit dense and I mean, Dan's a good philosopher, but possibly I should have chosen another quote. Um, but the point here is simple enough. Sartre and the other phenomenologists say, if we think about our visual field, there are all of these objects in it. Chairs, bodies, which may be robots, let's say, in this theoretical framework. Um, there are all of these objects in my visual field. So do I have any access to the other person as a subject? Well, it might be argued, no. Sartre says there is a way we can attempt to justify you all as subjects. It's through the experience of shame. When I feel objectified in this manner, Sartre says it presupposes that there is another subject, not just an object in my visual field, not just an object that I'm attempting to know, but my own feeling of myself as objectified presupposes the other as a subject with a free consciousness for Sartre's philosophy in much the same way.